Okay, we're back in America. Energy in America. I'm Jay Fidel, and it's Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Hawaii time. But it's not 3 p.m. Hawaii time in Washington. It's more like 9 p.m. in Hawaii time, in Washington time in Washington. And we have um, Max Pizier. Uh, he's uh, one of the directors uh, of EPRING, the Energy Policy Research Organization uh, in Washington. Uh, welcome to the show, Max. Thank you for having me. Uh, nice to be here. Yeah, great to it's see you. Been a while. Likewise. So you know, uh, we were trying to figure out what you know what is going on that's of consequence and uh, in energy in the world today. And uh, I had noticed it, and you certainly uh, have studied it, uh, namely the pipeline between Russia uh, and Germany. Now, more than one pipeline about to have two pipelines from Germany, uh, from Russia to Germany, and there's all kinds of implications to that. Uh, can you talk about it? Sure, absolutely. Um, the, the, the context is a little deeper and it's a little broader, and um, I, I was trying to how to, how to formulate a, a context for this, but let, let's go back to the mid-1970s. Um, in the mid-1970s, mo uh, the dominant fuel for all sectors, in sectors was, was crude oil. You had, in the mid-1970s, you had a major crude oil crisis, the Arab oil embargo, and then the Iranian revolution, which spiked uh, crude oil prices considerably imposed huge costs, uh, economic burdens, things like that. So various constituencies in the world were looking for ways to move away from uh, uh, crude oil. Uh, one candidate was natural gas. Uh, uh, at the same time, the Soviet Union um, uh, realized that it had an abundance of natural resources and was in need of hard currency. So the two things came together in the context of Europe. Um, in 1982, a huge pipeline system moving natural gas from uh, the Arctic regions of, of the Soviet Union and into uh, and, and, and Siberia moved gas to the various republics, including the uh, Republic of Ukraine, Soviet Republic of Ukraine, uh, through Czechoslovakia, which, which existed at the time, and uh, into Austria to be distributed further uh, throughout, throughout Europe. So that, that's the, uh, the energy context, the pipeline system that, uh, uh, that we have. Um, well, suffice to say that Russia has uh, an unending supply of natural gas, doesn't it, from various places around the country? Well, it, right. It, it, currently, it has the largest conventional reserves, natural gas reserves in the world, uh -huh. uh, something of, uh, over a trillion cubic feet conventional. But, the United States, with its share revolution, can, can certainly begin to compete um, oh. as more of that be resource becomes uh, uh, reserves, economically proven mm -hmm. reserves. Um, the other aspect is that Western Europe needs natural gas. Uh, they're not getting any, any, anything of consequence from us. Uh, so uh, the best source is from Russia, isn't it? Right. So that goes back to what took place in 1982. So you had this huge pipeline system commission. Um, Europe, European Union wasn't quite dependent on, on natural gas as it was then, but if we move to the present, um, Europe, uh, looking at my notes here, um, consumes about uh, 50 billion cubic feet per day. Uh, it produces about 15, so you have a differential that needs to somehow be made up. And the, the critical differential is made up through uh, the gas that is now sourced in Russia and transited to countries like Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland mm -hmm. into uh, the industrial countries of France, Germany, Italy, places like that. Mm -hmm. um, what you had also is a lot of uh, political contention. You had uh, 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 a major natural gas crisis in 2006, a major natural gas crisis in 2009. This is in Europe. This was brought on by disagreements between uh, what at that time was Ukraine and Russia, former uh, uh, fellow republics of the Soviet Union now um, becoming more and more adversarial. And uh, so given these problems that, that Russia had transiting in 2006 and 2009, and then also not being a, a, a reliable satellite country uh, of Russia, uh, Russia started decided to look for different ways of, of transiting its gas into its uh, critical commercial uh, regions of, of Central of Germany and, and France and Italy. Well, and that, that seems reasonable in the circumstances, doesn't it? I mean, 
Russia wants to sell the gas to Western Europe. Western Europe wants to buy the gas. Um, the Ukraine uh, kind of stands in the way, uh, and the Ukraine is not at peace with Russia. Uh, maybe Russia is legitimately concerned uh, that the Ukraine could cut that pipeline and uh, thus uh, hold it up. Right. right. Well, that's what happened in 2006 and 2009. Um, but since then, you have, uh, you have the existing pipeline system. It's reliable. It, it, it can ship 15 billion cubic feet per day, which, uh, given the metrics that I mentioned before, 50 and 15, so Europe can, European Union consumes 15, produces 15, it needs uh, a differential of 35. So 20 of that can come from uh, from, can be transited from Russia, and 15 can be transited through Ukraine. Um, but because there's all these points of contention, there's been an invasion of Ukraine by Russia and Russia's proxy, et cetera, um, the, the first pipelines, Nord Stream, bypassed, uh, uh, that, was, that was commissioned, it was commissioned in 2011. Let me, let me go so back for one second, Max, and that is that when the gas crosses Ukraine uh, in the existing pipeline through Ukraine, does Ukraine get a piece of the action? Uh, are they compensated uh, for having oh, sure. a... Yeah? Right. I mean, so it, it's uh, uh, the, the National uh, Gas and Oil Company, NAFTA, owns the transit system, and revenue that they derive from the transit system, which is uh, shipping fees, um, that affects the, uh, the budget of Ukraine. That affects the national budget of Ukraine. So, so it, 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 if uh, Russia bypasses the Ukraine, which it sounds like it's happening, uh, then Ukraine <laughs> makes less money from its own transit pipeline, right? Right, exactly. And the pipeline, and the way the pipeline systems are set up um, is to move Russian gas. You can't source gas from other countries that have gas, such as uh, Turkmenistan which has a huge uh, resource uh, of natural gas. Uh, all those pipelines uh, are directed towards the, uh, the producing regions of Russia. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it, it, it's the geopolitics of the region. So um, Russia wants to cut off Ukraine in different ways, but still rely on its uh, sources of, uh, of hard currency, which are the, uh, the industrial states of, uh, of Europe, Germany, France, Italy, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the, the pipelines, the first one's already built, huh? And, and uh, is, right. that, is that not take? That's not yeah. taking all the gas, though. Right. So uh, you have the legacy system, which was commissioned in 1982, that, that moves gas through Ukraine, through Belarus, through Poland. You have the Nord Stream One, which was to, uh, I don't recall exactly when it was started, but it's uh, uh, it was. Commissioned in 2011, and it uh, fully commissioned by the end of 2012. Uh, it runs at about 30 percent capacity, 30 to 40 percent capacity. Um, but what constituencies in Russia want to do is build a parallel pipeline that runs through the Baltic, under the Baltic Sea, from from Russia near St. Petersburg to a port city in Germany. So they want to build yet another one. So you would come. Uh, Effectively, you would challenge Ukraine or completely eliminate all the gas, Russian gas that is transited to Ukraine. Well, why? You know, I read about this, and my, my initial reaction, maybe it's naive, is uh, why would Germany do this? I, Germany wants the gas, um, but I guess Russia must have said something that if you don't cooperate with us and take this uh, Nord, Nord, Nord Stream pipeline, uh, you're not going to get gas. So you better you better cooperate, and you better you know forget about trying to preserve the Ukraine connection, right? Um, that's something um, something to it. It's, I don't know to what degree uh, Germany explicitly wants or needs the gas, um, but there are Germany's a liberal democracy. There's many different constituencies. There are lobbying interests. There are certainly uh, Russian lobbying interests. Uh, a former chancellor uh, uh, who preceded Angela Merkel um, is now, I think, on, on uh, Gazprom's board, Russia's uh, oh. uh, natural gas monopoly. So oh. Oh. I think Gerhard Schroeder, uh, that's the person's name. So oh. you have competing interests lobbying for and against 
uh, bringing in more na uh, natural gas via this Nord Stream system uh, through Russia uh, into Germany. Um, there has been speculation that maybe uh, there are German interests that want to create a natural hub system and thereby control natural gas prices throughout um, uh, Germany, France, and Italy. Um, and that would create certain frictions within the, uh, the European Union, uh, with Germany having such a stronghold on, on natural gas pricing. But that's speculation. That's just... Uh, yeah, I wonder, how, how does it work from, say, Germany to France or Germany to Italy? So now there's going to be a pipeline across Germany going west into France. There's going to be a pipeline across, uh, Ger well, coming down from the Baltic through Germany uh, and into, um, into uh, Italy. Does, does, right. uh, does Germany so make money on that? Sure, sure. There's, there, there, there's transit fees there. Um, uh, the pipelines are already in place. As far as it, it's, uh, there's major storage in and around Vienna. Um, there's uh, other storage facilities throughout the, um, throughout the whole EU. Uh, you have a weekly report that's very similar to the one uh, that's generated here in the United States. You have a weekly report that's generated uh, for the European Union telling you what the balances are, what the levels are. Um, that system is very transparent. Um, the system that's not particularly transparent is uh, the German constituency is aligned with Russia. The contracts that uh, uh, Russia creates with um, member countries, there are a lot of bilateral uh, uh, agreements. Um, to, to give you uh, some context for the United States, the United States sells natural gas. It doesn't say, well, Japan will give you a special price. The Philippines will give you a special price. Taiwan will give you a special price. There aren't those kinds of bilateral agreements. You have uh, uh, a system that uh, is, you have Henry Hub uh, pricing, you price against that, you put the gas in the cargo, and you ship it. Um, so the receiver knows the system that's used for pricing the gas, and then everything else is freight and uh, a little bit of uh, you know, mm -hmm. cost and, and, and a, bit, a bit of profit. That system doesn't exist uh, in the way Russian markets its gas uh, throughout Europe. I'd be worried about uh, monopolistic pricing because, you know, so far in this discussion, we've only talked about gas that comes from Russia, which Russia controls. Uh, right. And it is essentially, as far as that gas is concerned, it's a monopoly uh, holding, holding a sword over all of Europe's, Western Europe's head. And if it wanted to raise the price, what is Germany going to do? What is, what is France and Italy, what are they going to do? I mean, we haven't talked about Spain or, or uh, Holland or any of that. Or Switzerland, but right. um, or the soft underbelly either. Well, but, we have Germany, France, and Italy. Those are the key industrial countries of the European Union. But I, I mean, already you source gas from North Africa. Um, not a lot, but um, say I think five billion cubic feet from that metric that I uh, mentioned before, fifteen, fifteen. So uh, fifty being what, what Europe needs to, to consume, fifteen is what it can produce, and it needs to make up the difference in the middle. Um, so you get some from North Africa by pipelines under the Mediterranean. You get it from, primarily from Algeria to a lesser degree from Albania, uh, coming in through um, Sicily, Tunisia, Sicily, on to the, on the Italy, and up into the rest of Europe that way. Um, U.S. LNG, U.S. liquefied natural gas exports have become um, important. Uh, they're a Given what I described just a few minutes ago about how uh, U.S. The United States uh, interests market their LNG, the liquefied natural gas, they put it in butt and it's yours. You know, um, you, you know the price, you paid for it, you can do what you want with it. Um, that acts as a balancing system and, and as a buffer on um, Russia's uh, pipeline stronghold. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, okay, go ahead, please. Well, you, you, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you. Okay, well, um, uh, let's, let's wait together for a minute, Max. Uh, this is Max Peser. Uh He's the director with EPRINC. We're talking about the recent election in Ukraine um, and within the, in the context of the uh, Russian efforts to build not one, but two, possibly more, gas pipelines that cut Ukraine out. Uh, and how that affects Europe, the EU, and for that matter, NATO. 
uh, this is really interesting stuff uh, affecting Europe and, and uh, directly or indirectly also affects in the United States. We'll be right back after this one minute break. Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Max Peasier. He's director of uh, ePrink in Washington, D.C. Joins us by remote connection. We're, we're talking about the Ukraine today. We're talking about Russian gas uh, through, or maybe not through the Ukraine, to Western Europe, and how that affects the geopolitical mix uh, in Europe. So um, I, guess I, I guess I would ask you, uh, you know, where is the EU on this? Is the EU part of the arrangement by which gas uh, is transmitted through Europe? Um, the EU is a complex authority. Uh, it has uh, a cat herding problem. Um, its member states have its own ideas as to uh, how to proceed. You have a, a, a super authority that, and, and various uh, promulgations of ideas uh, as to how to create a unified system. Some of these things came out of the crisis that you had before. Some of the things that I mentioned are the 2006 and the 2009 uh, natural gas cutoffs that, that took place. Um, they, uh, the EU realized that it needed to have um, more robust uh, integrated systems. But so in those particular cases, that's where the crises were. But other kinds of other crises that uh, the European Union has had, it hasn't bolstered a unification. It's it's some sort of a disunification. So the European project, as EU people to me uh, have described it, uh, is, is failing um, in that sense. So it's, it's being undermined. Um, mm -hmm. So you have a fragmentation. You have fragmented interests. You have uh, Germany going one way, and within Germany itself you have constituencies that some favor Russia, tighter, tighter relationships with Russia, or more EU-centric, more, um, you know, the whole Brexit uh, uh, phenomenon. Yeah, well, this, is, this is so interesting that, you know, Vladimir Putin would like to undermine the EU. Likewise, he'd like to undermine, you know, even more, he'd like to undermine NATO. Um, and right. this, is, this is one way that he can do. T tell us how that works and what effect is it having on the solidarity of the EU and the solidarity of NATO? Well, um, I, from what, how I understand it, um, the EU uh, questioned um, uh, the United States' uh, effort in Iraq. That undermined the, the, the confidence of, of uh, EU member states, and that began uh, the political fragmentation of the EU, from away from an integrating uh, power uh, to one that's fragmented. Um, Russia has exploited that uh, to a great degree. Um, Russia, but still, Russia's natural resources have no uh, strong internal market, so they need um, to market their natural resources into places like the European Union. Uh, Russia is a hegemon. Um, it wants to uh, influence its neighbors. It wants to uh, engage in geopolitical uh, conflict. It wants to influence those things. NATO is uh, is an obvious threat to that. So um, by undermining the EU, the next step would be uh, would be NATO. So mm -hmm. um, you've had 
quote unquote relative peace since 1945, um, you, that's, it's not imminent, but that can be jeopardized, say, possibly within the next 10 years. There's been an awful lot of damage already within the last 10, 15. Um, uh, I'll leave my thought there. Well, I, you know, it's, it sounds to me like uh, Vladimir Putin has a long range, multifaceted plan to undermine both the EU um, and NATO to improve, uh, you know, the relative power of Russia. And this is one terrific way to do that. I mean, uh, right. the, the threat. The well, threat he, of he's, a, he's a tactician. I, I don't know if he's got a strategic plan, but um, he's a tactician and he wants to survive. He doesn't want to end up like uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to have an internal revolution that sort of uh, you know chases him into uh, uh, you know some 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 canal or whatever, and uh, that'll be the end of it. Um, and he succeeded uh, in in the sense that he's preserved his power, he's expanded his power, and um, he's destabilized uh, his neighboring constituency. Mm -hmm. And that gets to Ukraine, where Ukraine is in the, um, uh, it it has uh, a very strong sense of its sovereignty. It has a very strong sense of its nationhood. Um, it has a uh, it, it, it's a liberal democracy, but its institutions are, are relatively young and not fully experienced. It's not mm -hmm. something like the United States, where um, we, we have uh, the political situation that we have. Here, our institutions are still delivering. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the Defense Department, et cetera. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please. So, the, well, you, you have this uh, new election uh, recently. Well, I guess if only a, a week or two ago, uh, with this fellow Zelensky. April 21st. Right. And Zelensky, a comedian, a 41-year-old yes. comedian, and uh, that, that's not the old guard at all, uh, except there's this word that Zelensky's connected with some oligarch in Russia, so he may, he may have, you know, connections that affect his judgment. But, um, well, no, actually, actually, he's connected to a Ukrainian oligarch, and a very important all these oligarchs, it, you know, which team do they play for? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, in, in, in the case of uh, the oligarch that Zelensky connects to, it, it, it's a very much Ukrainian one. But this Ukrainian oligarch wants to preserve his wealth within Ukraine. Um, <laughs> and his wealth in Ukraine is being challenged because uh, the scuttlebutt is, is that there was a bank. He, he, he siphoned off billions of dollars. He's accused of siphoning off these billions of dollars. And he's fled the country. He's fled prosecution. So he's living abroad. This uh, Kolomoisky, the name of the oligarch. Um, people say he bankrolled uh, Zelensky's election. Um, Zelensky's careful to say yes and no. But what got Zelensky in the power was that he had a TV show on this guy's uh, television channel. Um, and he... And he played a Ukrainian president on, on the TV channel. So <laughs> right away, he had name recognition. Um, and the people were so dissatisfied by the incumbency, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. So slow moving on, on resolving the, uh, the war, uh, not enough fight against the corruption. I mean, you can say, well, corruption has improved. Uh, we, we've uh, won by 6%. We've, we've, we've uh, uh, normalized the country by 6%. But how do you see that? You can't see that. So. This affected electric goes and uh, elects somebody like Volodymyr uh, Zelensky, which, um, you know, if we look back on our election of Donald Trump, it makes perfect sense. I mean, there are certain constituencies that were so grossly dissatisfied. You, you had um, a strong bureaucratic candidate, a, a candidate like, like Hillary Clinton. She would understand the bureaucracy, but she had her own problems. So the same thing with the incumbent in Ukraine, Poroshenko. He... He had his own problems. He had, didn't divest himself into wealth, and so on goes on like that. Um, so that's why he brought Zelensky. Zelensky um, already in, in confrontation with, uh, they're having kitchen arguments. He's not, he hasn't been inaugurated, but he's having kitchen arguments with uh, Vladimir Putin. Putin said something, and Zelensky counted him right away. Um, well, that's Putin that's, offered the, uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I mean, uh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear he's resisting Putin because Putin is the, 800 pound gorilla in the neighborhood. Um, but I, I wonder how, how do you feel this election and uh, Z Zelensky's, uh, you know, <coughs> Zelensky's success in the election uh, will affect the pipeline issue and energy uh, either through Ukraine or in Western Europe through these two additional pipelines, uh, uh, you know, north to Germany? 
I wasn't expecting that question. I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I uh, um, you know, I, I, I think the energy dilemma of, the, of transiting uh, Ukraine having this asset, this resource, uh, a pipeline transit system that could be utilized to efficiently move natural gas into the United States without um, additional um, uh, investment into uh, a second pipeline uh, underneath the Baltic, that should be utilized. Um, but uh, what I think Vladimir Putin wants and uh, the constituency around him you know, they want to be control. They want to be able to control uh, the countries around him. They want to control the, the quote unquote the abroad. Um, and Ukraine has proven that it's a liberal democracy. It's successfully gone through three or four presidential elections. They were they were unencumbered. Uh, you know, candidates have won. They've displaced the other. You look at all the other countries around there. It's the same person in power mm. for the last twenty twenty five years. Mm. Um, mm. Maybe Vladimir Putin. Okay, Putin's been involved in power almost uh, 20 years. Um, so that cham- challenges the orthodoxy in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, that's the threat. So How I, it affects uh, the resolution of the national gas? I, well, all I think, all things okay. considered, uh, Zelensky is, would not have been Putin's choice. And all things considered, uh, Zelensky is not a, a predictable feature that. Uh, a predictable government that 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 Putin can easily manipulate. Um, Absolutely, so this right. is not his. This is not what he wants. And I guess it. I guess it actually uh, leads us uh, leads Putin in favor of the of the pipelines uh, to Germany rather than trying to reinstate a pipeline relationship or or continue a pipeline relationship through the Ukraine. But I want to ask you right. one other thing before we run out of time, Max, and that is. So you, know, you have this odd arrangement with all this gas, you know, it's kind of a monopolistic kind of arrangement through, uh, through Europe with Russian gas. Um, and that, that, could, that could be very problematic in case Russia wants to turn it off again. But query, right. is any of that gas going to, to the UK? Um, that's my first question. I mean, it was, 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 is any of this Russian gas going... Um, back across the channel to the UK, or, or does the UK have other yeah. sources of energy? Well, the UK is sort of an outlier, but there, there's the pipeline system that uh, uh, exists between the UK and mainland Europe is known as an interconnector system, which means you can transit the gas either into the UK or from the UK into Europe, depending on who has the surface and who wants to move it. So uh, eventually that Russian gas can get into... Um, uh, into the UK. And speaking to uh, uh, the problem that you're uh, presenting, the, uh, the monopolistic situation, mm-hmm. here in the United States we have a pi- pipeline systems, but the way the Federal Energy Regula- Re- Regulatory Commission regulates it, it's, these pipeline systems are uh, common carrier. What that means is, is they, they cannot, um, they cannot, they can't show bias to where they, where they get their supply. Um, if a, a, a natural gas producer says, I can deliver gas to your uh, terminal, your, your injection point, at a certain price, uh, and you have capacity, you have to buy it. It doesn't matter where you source the gas. In the context of uh, what's going on in Europe, specifically with Russia, Russia is biased towards its own resources of gas. It doesn't want to inject Turkmenistan gas. It doesn't want to bring in gas from Kazakhstan or um, some of the other uh, countries in, in the region. It, right. uh, it wants to control its own source of welfare. Right, right. It's all about control. One last question before we go, and, and that is the U.S. And recently, uh, uh, President Trump uh, indicated he wanted to get a waiver uh, for ships carrying LNG. I don't know if that's limited to ships carrying LNG to and from, or rather, to Asia, or whether it also includes American ships, or rather, foreign whole ships non-Jones Act ships carrying gas from our East Coast uh, to Europe. Um, is, does that affect gas going to Europe? Does it affect U.S. interests or U.S. sales of LNG? Are we a player well, in I, all this? Oh, well, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think we already have uh, LNG going into Europe, uh, U.S. LNG going into Europe. Um, and 
if I didn't say it before, uh, you know, that, that impacts the whole uh, dynamic that, that, that Russia, with its heavy hand in us, uh, can control. The, the, uh, the degree to which um, uh, Russia can um, uh, extract, extract monopolist prices. Um, so I, I don't, you know, as far as waivers, um, I, you know, I, I think once, once uh, boats in the water uh, coming out of the uh, uh, U.S. Gulf Coast uh, with, uh, with LNG, or there, there are even uh, uh, East Coast facilities now, um, it, it can sail to uh, wherever there's a market. There's certain provisions in the, uh, um, in the free trade agreements that are uh, controlled by mm. uh, Lighthizer. The, uh, I, I, can't, I, I, don't, I, I don't remember the name of the agency that he, can, uh, that he runs, but uh, the trade rep, Lighthizer. Mm. Um, there are certain, um, but these are formal agreements. They're uh, tested. It's not something that's ad hoc or uh, provisional. Uh, something to watch for sure, Max. Uh, LNG Absolutely. is uh, so important everywhere in the world, and especially in Europe. And uh, I mean, it's good that we have the ability to export it. Well, that's uh, Max Pijer uh, with ePrint. Thank you so much for joining us today and explaining this process to us and these events. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much, Dave. Aloha. All the best. Look forward to the next time. Aloha. Yeah. Look Thank forward. You.